Shalom, shalom to everybody. Uh, it's good to see that we have a, a, a good presence here. I'm glad to see faces. And if any other brave people want to show their faces, that would be even better. It's really nice talking to people's eyes rather than to their names. Uh, and we know we, have, we start on a triumphal moment. This is a triumphal moment in Jewish history, the moment of Lech Lecha. Anyone who knows anything knows that that is, in a way, the beginning of everything for us, for, for, our, for our nationhood, for our religion, for our culture. Something new begins in the creation of the world. The world has long been in, been in being. It's gone through all kinds of adventures all kinds of disasters, including a huge one, and that was the flood itself. Ten generations have elapsed since then. And one of the, the interesting things that one notices if you look closely, if you look closely at the text, is that whereas the ten generations before Noah, from Adam to Noah, each generation was described in terms of someone being born, um, having children and dying. The main events of a, a life that aims towards uh, duration, towards, um, what shall I say, towards uh, eternity, to be able to live on from generation to generation. And death happens, of course, in each generation. But after Noah, the formula changes that each person is born, he has children. And then there is the next generation. And there's no mention of death. So that is, for 10 generations, it seems as if people are really single-mindedly focused on one thing. And that is having children, creating life, creating a future. We don't know anything about the ethical quality of that life. But it certainly is, you know, it's a vigorous engagement with the business of generation. Um, until you come to Avraham's family at the end of last week's Parsha, where suddenly we read that his father dies and then mysteriously his brother dies in the lifetime of his father. And we close in suddenly on, on one family here, which is the family of Avraham, right? His, his, his original family, his family of origin. And suddenly there is death there. There is the normal death of the, the father, and there is the abnormal death of a young man, unexplained death. He dies in the lifetime of his father. So suddenly we have a real sense of a kind of, of a knot in the text, you know what I mean, a, a K-N-O-T, yes? Suddenly, oop, uh, I, I was so excited to see you that I forgot to dedicate the shear. So um, please forgive me, I will uh, now read the dedication, I think that's important. This class is dedicated by Joe Rich, Le'iloi Nishmat, his mother Ellen Rich, Etka Lea Batshraga Shachem. And so we go back to our, to our material. And I, I just, uh, again, another note before we begin. <laughs> um, the introduction comes after the beginning, as you see. Um, that I prefer to have comments and questions at the end of the class, not in the middle of the class. And also that if anyone has questions that can't be expressed in class, um, or you're too shy to speak in class, uh, then you are very welcome to write to me. Uh, I'm always open to letters and to answering the letters, if I can. Uh, my, uh, my, my, um, my, uh, Address is uh, netvision. Uh, sorry, Zornberg at netvision.net.il. Okay, back to our material now. And Avram, who is the son of this kind of complicated family in which death has really made an appearance, suddenly becomes he's focused on, and the fact that he marries and we hear the name of his wife. That's very unusual up to now. Nobody never got to hear the names of the wives. You know, as if she's also a person. 
Um, and she seems to have, and it's a complication about her name. In any case, the whole family picks up and travels from their place of origin without any command by God. The father, Terach, picks up the family and they travel. They're going to come to Eretz Canaan. That's the plan. Only for some reason, the plan gets cut short. And Terach, when he arrived at a place called Haran, he decides he's going to live there now. He's going to settle down there. Uh, halfway in the journey. No explanations. <clears throat> and then the next thing we hear is the beginning of our parsha, Lech Lecha, where God suddenly says to Avram, this man about whom we don't know, we know nothing spiritual. All we know about him is his family situation, his wife, who is barren, no possibility of doing what everyone else is doing, which is Leholid, to go on and have children. Suddenly, it's as if the end of a line. And that's the man that God chooses to address and to say, Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha me artzacha. Leave everything, your land, your birthplace, the house of your father, and go to the land which I will show you. And then there are other verses. There's two more verses of blessings. I will bless you in every way. I'll make you into a great nation. But we tend not to focus so much on the whole speech of God. And we tend to focus on that first pasuk. And that first pasuk in which this mysterious address to travel, lech lecha, to travel away, not to travel towards, or so it seems. Because you're to, it's specified where he is to travel from very much specified and then it's left rather mysterious to the land which I will show you I will show you when you get there I'll indicate to you that you have arrived you know don't worry in a way there is a destination but really what God is saying to Abraham here quite it's quite a poignant note is my uh, what I'm asking of you now is to leave everything you know and go towards an unknown place and I'm emphasizing that I'm not telling you where you're going. My part of my message is that I'm not telling you where you're going. That's not just an accident that he, he doesn't know. That is part of the message. That's the par part of this revelation, which is the first revelation of God to our nation, to, to Avram. Where does Avram come from? Avram comes... According to Midrashic tradition, he comes from the generation of the Tower of Babel. He was alive at that time. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a long time ago, but in some, in some sense, he originates there. And if you remember what happens there, there you had a sharp reaction by the generation uh, immediately after the flood, uh, who wanted to create one culture one language, one religion, to create a, a group of people who would not be vulnerable to floods, right? who would not be disordered in their sexual ways, disordered in their thoughts. Here they would be, there'd be a kind of consolidation of humanity. And God comes and looks at this humanity, this emphasis on God's vision. And what he sees there, he says, Hen am echad velashon echad. Behold, one people and one language. That's not good. Quite a surprising rejection by God of what looks like a desirable unity in humanity. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be lovely to be able to say that now, that everyone is of one mind, everyone has the same sensibility and but God looks and he says, and now lo yivat mehem. Nothing will stop them. Nothing will prevent them with this kind of consensus that they have. This sort of single thought that they have. Nothing will prevent them from doing whatever they want to do. And the Sforno, among the commentaries, has the strongest translation of that idea. What, what does God not like about it? I didn't put it on your page. But what the Sforno says is this, if everyone is of one religion, one belief, and one language, and everyone can understand each other fully, 
you know, there's no misunderstandings, right? In such a situation, there will not be a possibility there will be no possibility of a single one of them, one individual, to set out on his own in a quest to know God. Everyone else will be unified, ferociously unified, in some kind of totalitarian state, which won't allow for the possibility of an echad. They will be so echad as a society, which somehow implies a kind of superficiality. How can you have a whole world echad in this world? Maybe in, in Olam Haba, maybe in the Atid level, but in the conditions of this world, that is a sinister thing where everyone is thinking the same and there's no possibility for a dissident to arise among them who has a passion to know God. What like that? Who has a passion to do what can only be done by an echad, by a singular person. To make room for that echad, God scatters all that unity. He disperses all that unity, and it sounds like a very violent, meaningless, chaotic movement, but it has a purpose to it. And the purpose of the chaos is the existence of an echad. The possible existence of someone who will be called echad. Is Avraham ever called echad? A test? <laughs> yeah. Well, he is actually. By the prophet Isaiah. Yeshayahu nun alef. Asu gimel, I think. Where God says about Avraham, he says, Habitu el Avraham avichem. He says to that genera his generation, who are suffering, from persecution and exile and war and, and, and with great turbulence. And he says to them, look to your father, Abraham, and to your mother, Sarah. I'm, I'm simplifying the text. Look at them. They are your role models. They are where you come from. You are, they're your origin. What, is the, what do you have to notice about them? About Abraham, for instance? He echad kreativ. I have called him one. I have named him as single. Now, you could take that. Probably the most obvious meaning is, you know, this is, if you're not familiar with my way of teaching, I like at first point out what most people would say, how to translate this. Ki echad kreativ. And only afterwards to suggest a different level of reading. So what would be the obvious level of reading? that he was just one person. He was a, a, single, a single human being. And I blessed him and I multiplied him. It's really a reference to Lech Lecha, to the Lech Lecha. I called him one. What does that mean? I know you're just one, but don't worry. I'm going to bless you and multiply you and make your name great and so on and so forth. He is your paradigm. He was lost among the nations. He was a yachid among the nations, Avraham at that time, because I exiled him from his natural environment where he grew up. And I, I asked him to go to a place where he was a total alien, where he didn't belong, Eretz Canaan. And just as he was a Yahid at that time, he was just one single individual. So you too, you should know that you too have been exiled among the nations now that you are a nation, and you are in a defenseless and vulnerable position. But I will bless you as I blessed him. That is the, the straightforward reading. And we could stop there. I mean, that's certainly consoling. I want to say it a little differently. To be a chad is not just to be a nebuch. To be an echad is not just poor you, you're only one. You know, you're a part of an alien whole. You're part of a whole society in which you're not really a part. Echad means yachid. And that's what the, the word that Rashi uses to translate it. And a yachid is, I would say, is a singular person. Right? That's a very nice word in English. Not just a single person, merely one, 
but a singular person, a person who is different and who will suffer from being different. But at the same time, that difference is something that I have named him, that I have detected in him his singularity. Not everyone has, God says, yes. I have called him by name. Le crow is to call by name. What's, what's Abraham's name? Echad. And of course, there is one Echad. And there is one Echad, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Echad. And so God has a strange intimacy with Abraham, which comes of Abraham's being alone in the world, singular in the world. The, the, the Jew in Galut, the Jew, that sense of a, a, a very intimate relationship that comes from the fact that God calls out Avraham's name. There's a special chavivut, the Midrash will say. There's a certain affection and intimacy between God and, for instance, we take a little leap, who is the other person who is called over and over again through the word calling? And that is Moshe, Vayikra el Moshe, the beginning of Sefer Vayikra, whole book is introduced with that. And a flood of amazing Midrashim respond to that by saying, he called to, to Moshe, first of all, to Moshe and only to Moshe. You know, you might ask why. There are other people that he could have called to. Um, it's the time of him. Um, but it's not just only to Moshe, but calling itself, calling by name, has its part of the message. It's a certain tone. It's a certain way of focusing attention in someone. I call out your name, and I want to claim your attention now, because we have a something of a private language between us, because you are chaviv to me, that very lovely, like family, family word that the child is chaviv to his parent. Chaviv is that kind of love, which is a tenderness, which is a sweetness of a, of a special language. So you have here an intimate language, which I'm suggesting is also the case with Abraham, because God also calls on him. God also evokes him and names him. And what does, what does he name him? He names it Mechad, according to Isaiah. And Isaiah is calling on the original text, our text of the parasha, Lech Lecha. What's the parallel here for that naming? God is saying to Abraham, you, you. He's calling out Abraham's name. Look how often the suffix you over and over again, you, 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 throughout the blessings. And so there is a focus here on an unknown you. We don't know anything about Avram, no. We don't know why God has focused on, why did God call out his name? Um, I have this very... Uh, uh, simple, simple, and a simple example. You now you're walking in the street and you're somewhere involved in your own private thoughts. You are alone in a way. You're walking, feeling not part of everyone around you. And suddenly someone calls your name. And that sudden shock of being known, someone knows me. And someone is making a claim on me. Someone wants a certain kind of attention from me. And that someone knows what I want. All I have to do is call out his name. And he already knows somewhere. He's ready for it. Even though one may have been officially very unready. You didn't expect to meet this person in the street. But suddenly, there they are. And with this, I want to come now and look more closely at that lech lecha which Isaiah remembers as God's call to singularity, as God's call to a certain quality of relationship with God, which I'm calling chavivut, which the Midrash calls chavivut, a certain kind of intimate affection. In, the in that language that God speaks with Moshe or with Avram, 
as he still is at this undeveloped stage, there is a lot of unknownness. We don't know why is Avram chosen. There's something mysterious about that. Avram doesn't know where he's traveling. God says to him, El Haaretz Asher Ar Eka, to the land which I will show you. And indeed, he seems to travel, uh, un, 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 uh, open travel, when he picks up his family and starts traveling. And it takes seven verses till he finally arrives, Pasuk Zayin. Yes. Uh, Pasuk. They come to the land of Canaan, and then he still keeps traveling. And then God appears to Avram and says, To your seed, I will give this land. And according to Ramban, and according to many Mephorshim, what this means is, that he travels with an out of, not without an idea of where he's going. He gets up every morning, not knowing whither he is headed. Now, that is a state of, of being that you could call madness. In fact, according to one Midrash, uh, people of that time regard him as a kind of strange local phenomenon. He's, he's become an urban legend or so, something like that. Tiru Meshugaze they say, say about him. Look at this crazy person, right? The word meshuga means someone who's wandering aimlessly, shogea. He's all over the place. Right? He's confused. He's, 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 he's wild. He's, he doesn't seem to have a direction where, he, where he's going. He's going from one place to the next place and the next place with a certain aimlessness, waiting for what? A message from God, which he finally gets in Pasuk Zion, where God appears to him. It's the first time there's been that word appearing. So this is a proper revelation. It's not just words. It's somehow God shedding light on the place where Avram is. And he's saying, you've arrived. This is the land. Now it takes seven verses in the Torah to read it. That's, you can do that very quickly. In real time, Ramban, for instance, suggests, um, I'm not going to read it with you, but you can see it um, in number in number three. Um, in fact, um, the passage I have in mind was, was cut at the beginning. I have to make sure to put it back in. Um, what was he doing during all that period after God said to the land which I will show you? Haya no dead v'holech migoy al goy. It's not, it's, the, it's before number three. Uh, he was wandering constantly, no dead, from one nation to the other, from one kingdom to the other. In other words, this was not a matter of a few days. This was a matter of a long, protracted, blind journey. Country and country, no dead, navanad, that root, no dead, navanad, kain. There it was a curse. Here, God has told him paradoxically that this wandering condition, which is experienced by a human being as a curse, naturally speaking, that's a very unpleasant thing to be doing, to be traveling and traveling to some unknownness and constantly unstable, constantly somewhere, not being able to make plans. We have, we have analogies for that in our experience. And in this situation, it has become God promises paradoxically, for you it will be a blessing, that all this will be a blessing. And Ramban describes it very, very graphically. He ends up by saying, Avram himself, it's a very strong, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I think it, I, I can't resist it. Look at the end of number three, that from the beginning, he didn't know where, where he was going. And that's why later, much later, it's chapter 20, when he's talking to Avimelech, the king of the Philistines, he remembers his early life and he says, from the beginning, ka'asher hit uoti elokim. When God made me wander, there is that word in a different form, to'eh, 
Toe, which be, you know, it's a strange word. Toe, really, what, what is the force of it? What does the feel of it? To be toe. God, and that's a word that Avram uses about his own travels. Um, and he says it very straightforwardly, very, very, very honestly. And Ramban helpfully simply adds, Ki haya toe kese oved. He provides you with an image to understand what is it to be, to, be, to be a wanderer, like a lost lamb. He was wandering like a lost lamb. Now, you could read this a little sentimentally, um, which is, you know, that Ramban is providing some pathos here. He's saying you should know that wasn't an easy journey to be, to be lost in that way. But the fact is that Ramban is a little more uh, muscular than that. Um, and what he's actually doing is quoting from Tehillim. He's bringing a pasuk from Tehillim in which the psalmist says, cries out to God, Ta'iti kase oved, I've been wandering like a lost lamb, Bakesh Avdecha. Please find, right? look for, find your servant. I am totally lost. I don't have a... a um, what do you call it, a compass? I don't have a, what do you get, how do you have in the cars? Sorry, my mind is, is I'm, I'm a bit mindless these days, yeah? Well, you don't have the guide of where to, of where to go. Um, Ways. And, what is it? Ways. Thank you. Ways. <laughs> you don't have ways, and so you cry out to God, that's all. Please find me, I, I'm lost. And Ramban is invoking here, it's not just a sentimental image. He's invoking the psalmist who describes this as a human experience, not just of one man at the beginning of our history that we started as wanderers and not even just as a Jewish experience, but as a human experience, the experience of being lost and needing to find oneself or be found as a basis of one's relationship with God. Now, with this, I want to this difficulty of what Avraham endures, I want to move on to number four. And I want to move on to, this, this is the first Midrash in Breshit Rabba that focuses on the word Lech Lecha, the beginning of the parasha. And what I want to be doing for the rest of our meeting today is to be looking at an, a few, I think it's three perhaps, three, four such Midrashim, which are all focused on the word Lech Lecha, and particularly on the word lecha. What does that word lecha add to the word lech? Go, right, no, it isn't, it isn't you, you can't translate it idiomatically, go to you. It's not go to you. It usually is understood if you don't want to follow the Midrash, then you understand it as the biblical Hebrew. This is the way biblical Hebrew goes, that sometimes a lecha is added on, or a li is added on to give a certain kinetic force, a certain movement to the verb, shlach lecha, and so on, elech li. It, it, it's a kind of stylistic uh, of trill. But the Midrash takes the word very seriously. And there are very profound things suggested here, starting with this one, perhaps the most famous one. God said to Avram, lech lecha mi'aretzachim, Rabbi Yitzchak patech, he, Rabbi Yitzchak quotes from Tehillim. He opens up Tehillim, the Psalms. Shimi bat urui v'hati oznech v'shichichi amech u'betavich. Listen, daughter, and see. Pay attention. Listen, see. Mobilize your senses. V'hati oznech and incline your ear. Close attention. V'shichichi amech. And forget your people and the house of your father. Now, the Midrash takes that pasuk from Tehillim, mysterious pasuk in which a young woman who's going to get married is asked, is asked to alert her senses, not to put her senses to sleep, but as part of alerting herself for the journey 
what the bridal journey in which she will go to meet her unknown husband. That's the, the, the poignant classic situation of every bride in traditional narratives, yes, in, his, in his, historical times. These are marriage, these are political marriages, these are marriages of state. There is no love before marriage. There is that blind journey, which involves not only not knowing the man you're going to marry, but also having to cut off because of distance, being obliged to cut off connections with, as, as Avraham is told, with every level of connection in, that you have in, in, your, in your world. Beit Avich, cut off that, that very deep connection with your father, for instance. She is a young woman, and there's almost an Oedipal, there's an Oedipal implication there somewhere. The idea somewhere that you know, this is her knowledge of love so far, her relation to her father. And somewhere, put that all behind you. In some way, lose yourself entirely. Now, that is the quotation. And from there, Rabbi Yitzchak picks up and says, this quotation aptly describes Avraham's situation. Avraham is the bride. Now, that's a really, that's a long stretch to take Avraham, who is to be a father in the end, who is to be a, a father of, of many nations, of, who is a very masculine figure, in other words, but who is childless and can't have children, right? He's caught in the horns of a, of a paradox, of a, of a dilemma. And suddenly he becomes a young woman. There seems to be, well, we just bridge that gap. And he becomes the young woman, and what we have then is here. here. But Rabbi Yitzchak said, this is like echad. Notice the word echad. Someone, X, who was moving from place to place, traveling from place to place, from one way of surrounding himself, a cohere with a coherent place, settling down possibly, finding a place to be, but he can't settle anywhere and he moves from place to place to place. And then suddenly he sees bira achat doleket, again that achat, this singular, suddenly as like a, a hallucination, suddenly he sees this castle on fire. Bira achat doleket. And he asks about it. Tomar, would you say, he's speculating now about this mysterious castle. Shehabira hazu manhig. Would you say that this castle, this palace, is without anyone in charge? That no one is running the show? No one is running this, this whole scene? He sits a love balabira, the owner of the palace, this castle glances out at him, it seats. It seats is a kind of minimal, it's a flash of the eyes, tzatz. But suddenly there's a flash of, of a gaze from the castle. And the owner says, Ani hu balabira. I am the owner of the castle. Now that sounds, you know, if you, if you listen to it, would you say that this is what this castle doesn't have an owner? Avraham wonders. He's asking a profound and a complicated question. Because if the castle is on fire, then it sure looks as if it's without anyone in charge. And so on that level, he is asking in an agonized way, in an anguished way, am I being forced to say that? Is that the answer, that there's no one? Clearly, he's reluctant. He doesn't want to say that. But it's such a world. What else are you going to say? It's on fire. What complicates the issue again is our understanding of the Midrash. Does the Midrash, when it uses the word doleket, bira doleket, does it mean on fire? Or, as some have understood it, does it mean a light, full of light, illumined? In other words, this is a civilized 
palace. This is a palace in which is a wonderful place to be. This is a place. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a flower of civilization, what we have there. In which case, he's asking a kind of absurd question. So could you possibly say that no one's in charge? Look how very civilized everything is. Look how very wonderful everything is. Now, these are two opposite ways of reading the Midrash. And um, in a certain sense, we have to choose. You know, we have to say it's either this or that. And on that depends how you can read the meaning of the Midrash. But maybe you don't entirely have to choose. And that's what I, I want to get to in the end, through the reading of the Mir Shiloach. But meantime, what do we have here? We have, we have left the bride behind, the, 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 the imagery of the bride, who is being told to forget everything that has made her reality up to now. Now, in that, what I hear is, in a word, anxiety. There's great anxiety in that demand being made of the bride to forget everything that gives her stability and to go towards the unknown and towards a relationship that she can have no understanding of at the moment. Look how the Midrash then ends. It goes back to our bride. Uh, after the obvious uh, um, analogy for the, for the castle, what do we have here? Avraham was traveling and he, um, he was traveling from place to place. And he said, when he saw the burning, burning castle, uh, he said, "Is could this world be without anyone in charge? And God looks out at him and says, I am the master of the world. And then we go back to Tehillim, to the bride. For the king will desire your beauty, for he is your Lord. That, those are the words of the psalm. He will des there will be desire, there will be beauty, there will be sovereignty. It's a new kind of relationship. And the Midrash unpacks it. The king will desire your beauty. Suddenly it becomes a little different. He will desire to make you beautiful in the world. Now, that's a very strange reading when you think of the bride. Right? The, the, the king that she's going to marry is going to want to to show off her beauty to the world? Is that really it? You know, fame, I'll make you famous. Is, is that really the desire of the bride? What, what, what can this be? But one thing we do notice is that if you read the Pasuk from Tehillim straightforwardly, the king will desire your beauty, it makes of her an object. She will be the love object the beauty, and he will love her beauty. He will desire her beauty. And this certainly is a way of describing erotic love, you know, um, certainly before the feminist uh, period, um, that that is her hope of happiness, that he will desire her beauty. Um, and so that, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's on, the, on, the, on the one hand. But the way the Midrash wants to read it is to transform it. You are going towards a transformative you are in the process of transforming yourself from a potential object of desire to a subject of desire. That is, you will become beautiful in the world. You will relate to the world in a mode of beauty. You will become a source of beauty for the world. That, that suggestion, which is that the call to Avraham here this is what is meant. Then um, the Midrash ends uh, demurely after this, these flights that go off in all these different directions, the bride and the castle comes back to, to um, square one. That's what it means to say, God said to Avram Lech Lecha. <laughs> as, if, as if now you understand the whole thing. Here, we understand something about the language of Chazal, the language of the Midrash. It's not Safa Achat. It isn't part of one language that everyone speaks. It's not part of the lingua franca, the, the ordinary language that would be very good to have when you're in a functional relationship to something. You know, when you're reading the instructions for your new oven, you would hope it would be in Safa Achat. 
you would hope it would be in clear language with no possible misinterpretations, no misunderstandings. So it's functionally a very good thing, Safat, but it's an entirely inadequate, superficial and dangerous language for a world that has ambitions to producing depth, the possibility for transformation. There you have to have language, words that you don't understand. I can put it like that. The first time you read this midrash, if this is the first time you read it, then when you are quite baffled. You're trying to follow the different strands of it. It starts somewhere, it goes somewhere else, goes somewhere. And I've been trying to, to, to shepherd you a little bit here, but I'm sure it's still not very clear. What you don't understand is the logic of it. What, what are we talking about here? And so we want to stay in some way with this midrash. We want to try to get deeper into it, to work with it. Because the midrash is saying here that this is really the meaning of lech lecha. That the meaning of lech lecha is being faced with something you don't understand, being faced with anxiety, letting go of all your past models for understanding the world, right? In a way, a kind of disintegration of your ego. I'm using psychological language now. There is, um, there is a writer called Herbert Fingeret, who has quite a wonderful book called The Self in Transformation, in which he argues that an essential phase in any history, any personal history of transformation, anyone who's undergone great and presumably good change in, in one's life, an essential part of that is anxiety. And he talks about anxiety as not just as a feeling, as a sensation, but as a way of being in the world, a necessary way of being in the world because it means letting go of the apparently unreliable supports of the past and acknowledging a depth to things, that things are deeper, both for the good and for the bad. Things are more complex than I had at first thought. Who am I now? And who Avram is here, according to this midrash, is a traveler. He is someone who is moved, God, as it were, has given him a little nudge off balance. He's pushed him off balance. Off balance into a world in which he will look mishuga to other people. Because somewhere what he is doing, as all people who seek transformation will do after him, people who, who go into therapy or analysis or go into religious uh, initiations, uh, of one kind or another, many religions have, have something of this, is he's going into a journey whose end he doesn't know. He doesn't know what it means to become himself, to become a new self. But one stage of that is to let go of the apparent self, the starting self. And so God and through, through God, Avraham, Avram, is here in the position of recreating himself. As we said last week, like the, 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 the potter, like the ceramicist who gets their hand deep in the clay, into the material, which is a meaningless material in a sense, it's just matter. Or perhaps even more vividly, this is Gaston Bachelard again, even more vividly, what does the person do what does what a human being do with his creative imagination? Someone who has a creative imagination and wants to develop it, wants to be transformed from something that is now felt to be inadequate. What, what, what must he do? So the idea then would be not to form new images, but to deform old images, first of all. You take something that's already there, right? Something has appeared from your hands. And you look at it and you say, no, that's too banal. That makes me feel too safe, too secure. That can't be it. And you keep looking 
and you keep molding deep and you find the forces there of the material responding to your hands and you responding to the material, some interaction happens that you can't foresee. You can't know ahead of time how it's going to, how it's going to go. Now, that blind process, God is saying to Avram, is a creative process. You, I want you to create yourself. That's the bride. I want you to open yourself now to an experience that you can't imagine ahead of time, which will have an effect on making you a source of beauty to the world. I would almost say that you have it in the text, actually. Right away, God, God blesses uh, Avram at the end of Pasuk Bed. I make you into a great nation. I will bless you, magnify your name, make you great in the world. Veheye bracha. That mysterious ending. And you will become heye. The word lichiot. Eheye asher eheye. Is not to be. Not be a blessing. It's become a blessing. You are not yet a blessing. How are you to become a source of blessing? A beauty. A source of beauty in the world. And there is no precise description of the, you know, there's no ways. <laughs> yes, there, there, is no, there are no instruction booklet. It's in a way to undergo a process. So that when God says, right, it's really quite wonderful. At the beginning of Basuk Bet, I will make you into a great nation. E'escha. The Midrash, Midrash Tan Choma, reads, I will make you with great, with great attention. I will create you. I will create you. You, with the word you first, you I will create as a new creation. It's a kind of new genetic development of humanity. <laughs> uh, obviously, I don't mean that literally, but that there's something, there's a new territory that has yet to develop from you, just you. At the moment, it's nothing else but you. You are Echad, with all the loneliness of Echad, but also with all the intimacy with God of the Echad, someone who has depths. Not everyone apparently has discovered their depths. Right? He has an unconscious, I would say. Therefore, his language has to be richer and more mysterious, and the language of God has to be richer and more mysterious if it is to house his unconscious as well as his conscious levels of, of being in the world. He is to become from the depths. Okay. Now, what, where I'm really going now is to the Mer Shiloh in number seven with his commentary on this Midrash. I just want fleetingly to glance at the Ramban and the Rambam number five and six on the way. And I'm not going to do them justice. They are both extraordinary in their way, but they are very contrasted with the, with the Midrashic source that we have been looking at, the bride and the castle and all that, in which there's not Safa Achad. There's no one single clear language. Here, Ramban asks, basically, um, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing very, very briefly, Ramban asks in number eight. Sorry, um, I've got a bit lost here in a moment. Yes, here we are. Yes, uh, it is number five, number five, I'm sorry, five and six, Ramban. He asks, I don't understand, Matan, what's the rationale of this journey that Avram is set upon, set upon? It doesn't make any sense, he says. I don't have a language to describe it. I can't use a spiritual language. I can't use an intellectual language. What was Avram, what was the point of telling Avram simply travel? Lech lecha, just leaving where he was from. 
that's that's a mission of some kind that's a beginning of a new civilization what what is that it's not it should have been put something like as it's put later uh, travel in front of me and be whole become whole that would be a spiritual challenge to him which would be rewarded by blessings but here all god asks of him is to travel it doesn't make any sense he says and then he provides, I, mean, I cut it off in the middle here because it was getting too long. He provides simply an intellectual and personal history of Avraham. What was Avraham's situation there, where he came from, or Kasti? And he makes use of that famous midrash about the burning, burning furnace, yeah, the, the fiery furnace. Uh, that Avraham's father was a merchant in in idol, idols, yeah, he was an idol merchant, merchant. He was heavily invested financially in the world of idolatry. And little Avraham, who may have been very small at the time, smashes his father's idols and is brought up to court into the presence of Nimrod, the ferocious king. And Nimrod throws him into a fiery furnace in which he, he that's it, that's the end of him. So he is a martyr. That's the background. He's already proved himself to be a martyr for the sake of his hatred of idolatry, his quest for, for something else. He always was that. And then God says to he's saved by a miracle. And then cutting, cutting a long story short, God says to him, Lech Lecha, which basically means leave this, this hopeless world behind you, the world of all these idols, and just start traveling to a place where you'll find people who will appreciate you, you'll become a teacher, you'll find students, and things will be much better for you. So it becomes a kind of pragmatic journey. It becomes a journey to a better place, you know, just you know, better for your career, almost, but it's in your spiritual career, you, you, you'll have a, a better time. That, that provides meaning to the journey. The Rambam takes it much more in an intellectual direction. That from the time he was three, he was just a baby. Right? He begins to. Immediately, this giant was weaned. You know, babies are weaned at the age of three, classically. Um, so he's just a baby. He begins a process. And the word Hitzchil is used over and over again in the Rambam. Each new phase of his intellectual development is a new hatchala. That he starts, first he starts roaming around in his mind. It's a wonderful expression. He's a vagrant in his mind, mishotet bedato, trying to work out, you know, perplexed, how is it possible that this ring of existence should move without anyone to move it? And Rambam, who is a serious Aristotelian and lives in an age when Aristotle what represented a certain ultimate intellectual truth, brings up the idea, the Aristotelian idea then, that Avraham all by himself works out that there must be, with all these moving spheres, you know, that the world was imagined as being, there must be an outer sphere which is the prime mover of the whole system. And that's what he was looking for. That, that's another way of talking about God. Rambam doesn't, doesn't, want, doesn't want to say there's any gap between the two, two ideas. They're the same idea. And once he arrived at that in his mind, he got to the truth, he began to teach it. And once he began to teach it, the state became worried about him. And the state had him up for judgment and condemned him to death. And he escaped by a miracle. Shades of whom? This is right. This is an alternative version of the Socrates story, and, and it's pretty clear I think, that the Rambam is thinking here of an alternative version of Socrates' fate as being the one gadfly in society, the one who thinks differently and tries to teach differently to young people, and is regarded as a danger to the cohesion of the state. Um, and is in fact executed. A different story in the end. And he says, but, uh, but Avraham was saved and Avraham begins to travel and travel and he tra wherever he travels, he calls out in the name of God. He names God. He claims that special relationship of God calling God's name with a certain kind of intimacy, 
In other words, he teaches God. He teaches about God and he gathers around him, which is another implication of the word, likro. Several times we have it in the later history of, of Abraham, that expression, vayikra b'shem Hashem. He called out in the name of God, Kel Olam, the God of the world. Um, one implication of that calling is to call people together. He called together myriads and thousands and myriads of people, says the Rambam. He is traveling with a whole new alternative society that he has, he has consolidated around him through his teaching of his own private understanding that he has developed in his mind. He, 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 he speaks about it not only to large masses of people, but like Socrates, one-on-one -on -one. dialogues, personal dialogues, one-on-one, -on -one, question and answer so as to deal with the questions of the other person, which is the only way of learning. Now, that is, in a way, not, not doing it justice, that is what the Rambam says. We're dealing with an intellectual breakthrough in the history of the world. And Avram is our creator of a new culture and of many, many people who follow that culture in one way or another. What both Ramban and Rambam are not paying attention to, perhaps deliberately setting aside, is the Midrashic tradition. The Midrashic tradition is not their direction. They are providing different kinds of answers, intellectual and uh, spiritual, pragmatic answers. What is Avram's purpose? Have a look at the Meshiloach. Number seven, God said to Avram, Lech lecha me lecha. Go, go, go from your land. Right? If you read Lech lecha without vowels, it really becomes like Lech lech. Yeah. How are you? Again, it's, it's not Safa Achat. It's not a transparent language, the Hebrew language. It doesn't have vowels in it. Right? It doesn't. It, 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 the whole idea is that you're supposed to realize as you read it, I don't quite get this. Or what I'm getting is insufficient. And that leads you on an endless quest somewhere to understand more and more. Uh, the Mea Shiloach, at the beginning of your page, or I can just refer to it now without going into it in great depth, reads that as the meaning of the word the expression that God uses to Avram, travel to the land which I will show you. And what Neshiloach wonderfully says, that Avram had his, this great desire to find the place of the attachment of his vitality to God. Where, where can he connect with God passionately? Until he arrived at a point where God said to him, to the land which I will show you. That is, you will arrive at the place, Hanikra Asher Areka. The place you will arrive at is named, I will show you, which is an endless place. Do, do, do you hear that? It's really quite extraordinary. It's, it's even a little disturbing in some way. He's saying it's a place of Ensof. And Ein Sof means, I don't get it. It means I'm not, I'm not in a position to grasp it all. And that's a very hopeful thing for the Meir Shiloach. Um, I was listening to a podcast recently um, by someone called Michael Silverblatt, who has an amazing podcast. He's a, he's a great lover of literature and teacher of literature. Um, and one, he said one simple thing which struck me as very, very deep and related to what we're talking about. He says there was a time that some of us people, older people remember, where at a very young age, children were confronted with texts that they absolutely didn't understand while they were learning to read. While reading wasn't yet so very well established, they were facing texts of literature. All right, well-chosen ones, ones that were possible to, to handle on some level. The teacher could help them. 
But no, what they read is, you know, Jack ran, Jill ran. They understand that very well. Safa achat. Of course, the advantage of that is, and of course, it's not, it's not a serious, it, it's quite a serious advantage, is that no one is then, no one loses courage. Everyone feels, yes, I can understand that, that's fine, I can master it, and we don't want to put anyone off reading, so we go for that. But look at what we lose. What we lose is that sense of addressing a text that addresses you with more than you can take. And that sense that there is a long way to go. And that sense of development. I come back to the text later and I realize how much I know, know understand of it. It's a very exciting and invigorating and vital sense of development, inner development. And here, the Miyashiloach wants to say that Asher Areka is the name of your destination. That, that's where you're going. Here he begins by quoting from Yeshayahu. It's interesting how Yeshayahu is the source of many proof texts on the word, on the words Lech Lecha. I'm sure there's a subject for, a, for, a, for an essay there somewhere. Yeshayahu says, uses an, an organic water image. Ki etzak mayim al When I pour water, I shed water on the thirsty and liquid on parched land. The idea here, the image here is of an interaction between a gift of water, an active force of water, and a thirsty receiver. Something, someone, the land, the parched land, the thirsty person is, is dying for this, for what's being, wants it. There's great desire here. It's the meeting of desire with something that comes from the outside. And switching sharply to Avraham then, Meashiloach goes on to say this. Avraham began, unlike the Rambam and Ramban, he didn't begin an intellectual progress. He began levakesh ulchapes, achar shoresh hachayim shelo. He began to seek and quest after the root of his own life. It's an inner, inner quest. How do I hold together? Now, this may sound a little narcissistic at first, but I want to, what I'd like to, to argue, what I'd like to show is it's, that it's the opposite of narcissism. After the root of his life, and, he, and he, after he had understood that there is nothing in this world, all the desires of this world, that deserves to be called life. It's an interesting way of putting it. Again, calling and naming. When I'm calling and naming something and saying, you are loved by me, you feel a need that I have, a need of a, of a special kind. When I, when, I, when I do that, then I realize I can't do that to anything in this world. Nothing in this world fulfills that need, which is the need of the root of my own life a real life, chayim amitim. These are all instruments. All the things in this world are it's for, it's for, for, for comfort and convenience and perhaps to give you time to think about, or uh, time and leisure to think about the real things. And so he is looking for the real thing, which is not what surrounds him. He has to detach his mind from everything that could give him a false sense of stability in the world. And for, because what he's looking up for is guf hachayim, the body of life. It's such an interesting image. We're talking here about organic images, about a flower that is to grow from a dry, parched land, if water is, 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 it falls on that land, about the body of Avram's vitality. It's not detached from his body, what he's seeking for, for here. Um, and the whole world has to be built. His world has to be built upon. It. And when he's looking everywhere for that kind of answer, then God says to him, Lech lecha. go to yourself, right? The simplest possible reading that we rejected to start with. It can't mean that. That's just too, too limited. Go to yourself. But for the Meir Shiloach, it opens up a world 
Lech Lecha. What is Lecha? Le'atzmecha. Go to your essential self, towards yourself. Because really nothing in this world can be called by the name of life and so on and so on. The essence of life you will find Becha. Nowhere else but in you. Don't look all around. Don't cast your eyes all over the place as you travel from place to place. Looking, hopefully, all the time. Is this the place? Is that the place? Look at you. Quotation from Yeshayahu again. Ve'ata tagil v'ashem. You shall rejoice in God. You read that plainly. It's simply a promise about our joy in God, that God will come through for us. As he reads it, it's the v'ata. Only through your deep experience can there be a finding of some kind, a, a sounding. You know, you will, something will begin to resonate in you and only in you. That is life. That's your connection with life. And then you come back to the Midrash with the, with the owner of the castle and he connects it. He says, when it says, he sits a love, he, he glanced a love upon him. He finds that to be a slight, he has a very sensitive ear for Hebrew. And he says, it should really be, he sits a love. Now, I haven't done an exhaustive check on the uses of the word he sits, you know, whether it usually is a love, but I can hear, I can hear what he's saying. Hitzitzi love would mean he, he looked at him. Yeah, that's what it means. God looked at him. Why does it say he looked upon him? And what he hears in it is that God, that Abraham Avinu, yeah, what, 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 let me say it in my language first, that God is focusing Avraham's attention on himself. Hitzitzi love. And he's saying to Avram, Tir Eb Atzmacha, look at you. Now look at you. If I don't carry on with it, has the distinct ring of what I called Chavivut, of Chiba. This is the language of calling. This is the language of what is now called um, among philosophers interpolation where God now is choosing an, an, an echad because of the potential of that echad to become aware of himself, to become aware of the depths of himself. And he is then saying, as one says, you know, look at you. You know, it's like a fond parent sometimes says to a child, you know, oh, look at you when the child is being a little uh, creative and mischievous and doing something a little a little wild and it's, it's said with a kind of smile look at you and it's as if here god is opening up for Abraham a way of looking at himself and of accepting the trouble within himself because according to this extraordinary reading Abraham is deeply troubled at this moment of his life. When does he live? He lives at the time he goes back to Dor Haflaga, to the time when God threw confusion into the world. He split up that false unity of Dor of, and that generation was called Haflaga. It's not. It's not a Hebrew word. It's not a biblical word. It's a word from from later Hebrew that Chazal use, the sages use to describe that generation. What is Haflaga? One is maflig on a ship. Yeah. If you if you if you go if you set sail on a ship, you it's, that's the word that's used. You 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 are launched. It's not quite the right word I want. You depart. Right. The simplest translation. It means to split off in some way from where you were. It means to depart on your own route, to go go off somewhere. And that was what the world was doing in general. They were all, all over the place. And Abraham looks at this incoherent, chaotic world in which everyone is, no one knows where they are. There is no order at all. There's no makom at all. And he's desperately looking for a makom to be, to attach himself to, and to say, that's my place. And he's feeling 
basically basically tormented by his own self, by his quest, which doesn't seem to have an answer. And God says to him, just look at yourself. Do you realize how singular you are? No one else is troubled by the state of the world or by your own condition, except you. You are the one who finds it strange, who finds it anomalous to live in a world in which, which is the equivalent of the Birado Leket, the castle on fire. Everyone else regards it as a very nicely organized, civilized world to be living in. You know, it's, 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 it's regarded as, a, as the flower of civilization up to now. Only you are troubled by it. If you look at your own trouble, if you look at your own kushia, your question, you will find the answer in the question itself. That is, perhaps God is saying to Abraham, accept yourself instead of berating yourself and feeling all the time, why am I like I am? You know, why, why am I so, so, tr so troubled all the time? Look at yourself and find there, accept how you are, your troubledness, and find there the clue, the hint to that sense of being called that I'm now bringing to the surface, lech lecha. This is a lech lecha, go, go, go there. Accept a certain responsibility. Now that you've noticed it, now that you've engaged with that trouble, find a way of bringing some kind of transformation to yourself, to the world. That is, somewhere here, the Meir Shiloach wants to say that that wrongness that you feel in yourself, that sense of being all over the place, not being happy with it, um, God aroused your heart to feel that way. Heir libcha. God is the one who arouses. And in your heart, you will find God. Therefore, you will find the presence of God. Rabbi Tzadok Akon, the next generation of great Hasidic leaders, was a student of the Meir Shiloach. And he, in one of his books in Sidkat Tzadik, in more than one place, actually, well, it's Resh Mem Zayin, if anyone wants to follow it up. He takes this, his teacher's Torah, and takes it one stage more radical. And he says, basically, that that in you which is troubled, that is my shechina in you. He right? takes it really, it's quite a provocative. Uh, philosophically, this kind of uh, thinking is called pan panentheism. Panentheism is not that God is part of me, but that I am part of God. But if I go in very deep into myself, then there is something of God in me. There is much of God that is not in me. I, I'm not the limit of God. But there is a certain depth to be found there that has to do with turmoil, that has to do with, with the necessity for going through a phase of, of turmoil. Now, as our time moves on. I want to look with you at a couple of a couple of midrashim that follow that first midrash. Have a look at number eight, for instance. God said to Avram, Rabbi Vrachia, quoted from the Song of Songs, L'reach shmanecha tovim shemen turak shmecha. The, the lover is praised here for his beautiful spices. It smells very good. Uh, your name is like decanted oil, decanted perfume. You pour perfume out from one bottle to another, let's say. And suddenly there is this delicious perfume. And that's what you are like, says, I think, the woman to the man. Yes, obviously here says that the woman is quite a, a voice in the Song of Songs. She is not just the object of beauty. She is the subject of beauty. She is the one who points out beauty in, in the lover. 
And that's what she's saying to him. Rabbi Brachia then takes that verse that we are wondering about, what's that got to do with anything? And says, why was Avraham compared to a, bo a bottle of, let's say perfume, bottle of spices, a little flask of spices, surrounded and held in place in a corner. That is closed tight and held in place in a corner. In other words, completely stable. He has a place, it has a place. That was Avraham. He had a place, but it was a place that couldn't be a place. That's not the place for perfume. Perfume is supposed to do perfume. It's not perfume until what happens. Uh, well, till that point, till till what happens if it's in the corner, um, its 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 fragrance does not diffuse. The problem with that kind of stability, staying in a place that's an obvious place and not going in to do the deep molding work that we've been talking about, is that the fragrance does not diffuse outwards into the world. But when the bottle of perfume is shaken up, mitzaltelet, very strong words I want to, to say something about. It comes from the word latul, to take it, to take something up and move it. Niti lat yadayim. Right. You, 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 you wash your hands and you raise them up. And it's complicated. It's agitated. That word is shaken up. Tul, til tul. And so it means much more agitation. Once this was agitated, once this was in a turmoil, it was in a storm emotion, then it's fragrance could evaporate, could, could, could diffuse. So God said to Abraham, keep harrying yourself, keep on that, 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 that passage through an experience of being swung, being hurled, being exiled, I'm translating the word till tul, till tell it, in which there is a sense of unsteadiness, of being distracted, of being distraught, of being deranged, of traveling. Travel, it's a word for travel simply. That sense of not being centered. And Avram is here told, not I'm going to do that to you by God, do it to yourself. Taltel Atzmacha, make yourself less at ease in the world. Because the good news of that is that what is in you will begin to become itself. It will be transformed into something that can do perfume. And what is the perfume that it does? It will go out to the whole world and affect the whole world with the source, a certain source of blessing and beauty. Alken alamot ahevucha, another verse from the Song of Songs. Therefore, young girls have loved you about the king, about the king, about the lover. That this is an erotic history that, that he has. And that rather strange verse is picked up by the Midrash that says, that's Avraham. Avraham, who was Avraham? Avraham was someone who went about the world being loved by everyone. Now, that's not being a, a, a beauty object. Not being, it's not that kind of relationship. He went about the world sort of charismatically conquering the world. It's that people found him in some way intimate with them. That in some way when he spoke to them, he wasn't a philosophy teacher teaching philosophy as the Rambam has him. He was someone who spoke from soul to soul in some way, from turbulent soul to potentially turbulent souls. And that's, that's how Chazal look at him, at least in, in, in some of these, in some of these uh, Midrashim. And that is to be the power of Avraham in the world. It's to be a power of a kind of turbulence, right? A kind of the capacity to transmit messages, not through intention, and finally created paragraphs and a, 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 a transparent language, but rather through a demonstration, almost a, a, a performance of himself, of performing his own unsteadiness, of performing his own continual quest for more, for, for, 
um, number nine. We still have a little, a little, a little time. Another, a very beautiful pasuk, but also strange one, from Tehillim. Lecha tal v'yalutecha. To you belong is the dew of your youth. Something about the freshness of your youth, the beauty of your youth. Somehow it's, it will always stand in your good stead because you will not do anything shameful in your youth. Your youth will stand by you. Your youth will be more than blameless. It will have a certain, the beginnings of the possibility of transformation, something, something good there. The dew of your youth. But look at how, the, how Chazal now write about this. What do they think about this verse? Avraham Avinu was anxious. Right? He's not just enjoying the, his youthfulness. He's anxious about his youth in the past. And he says, would you say that I still have in my hand, I'm still somewhere, it's holding on to me and I'm holding on to it, my, my sin of the past, the sins of my youth. I was a worshiper of idols. Now that we remember from the Seder night. Yes, yeah, and that Avram himself was a worshipper of idols. We begin the story, the beginnings of our history. I'm sorry? What? Can you, uh, could you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Um, that that um, uh, Avraham began by worshipping idols. And uh, please mute, mute yourself, okay? Uh, and here now he's worried. And he says, perhaps I'm, it's still sticking to me, all that idol worship. Who says that that's behind me? And God answers him, Lecha tal According to the Medrash, Avram is eight time. That's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Azrachi. Um, Eitan was a boy, yeah. I see. King David's court, well known for his wisdom. He wrote Psalm 89. Let's see. Let's see Tehillim 89. Thank you. Uh, this, this is the kind of comment that I really would like you to bring up afterwards, you know, because you, my train of thought is <laughs> it's difficult for me to hold on. Thank you. Can you, can you tune off now? Thank you. Um, what is uh, what is Abraham told here? Just as this dew, what is it about dew? That this dew evaporates into the world, so your sins evaporate. Strange image. Just as this dew is a sign of blessing to the world, so you are a sign of blessing to the world. Now, he's worried about his sins and he's worried about himself. That his sins are part of himself. I'll get out of this. What? Please do mute yourself. It's really not very considerate. Um, the dew. What is it about dew? The shame Mishmuel picks up the midrash. See, it's a number number eleven, and he has this to say. Try to understand it. What is Avram being told about his past sins here? And he puts it into the context of the nature of dew. Think about dew as such. Compare it to rain, for instance. Rain falls on the earth and heavy fall of rain and is, is then absorbed in the earth and stays in the earth so the earth becomes thoroughly moistened by the, by, by the rain. What does dew do? It falls in very small drops. And all it does, rakm or it just awakens, arouses. It acts as a catalyst for your own inner moisture, for what the potential for developing moisture in the earth. The earth is thirsty for moisture. And so it's a transaction of some kind. The rain is not a transaction. The rain is simply a one-sided thing and it comes from God. And that's not good enough. And so the prophet um, Hosea, the Shem Yishmuel quotes him, says, says, you've asked for, 
says that people ask for rain when they pray to God. And in, elsewhere in Hosea, we read God saying in answer, I will be like dew. And the Gemara comes and says, you've asked for something that's not appropriate. And I will tell, I am giving you something that is appropriate. What you're asking for is rain. You're asking for me to come as a force from outside, as the force from outside, and infiltrate you and in a way, in a way set you aside. You will become in a way nothing. What I'm offering you is God as due, the Shekhinah as due, as an awakening force that awakens the depths and possibilities inside you. There is a, there is a phenomenon that you might, uh, we might have heard of called Petricor. Uh, it was first noticed in, in Australia, where before the rains fall, after a long drought, there is a smell in the air. There is a smell in the air before there is any actual moisture. Now, the moisture has begun to form, but it's there and it comes out of the surface of the earth. It comes out of the rocks, out of those dry rocks. The rocks intuit that the rains are about to fall. There is that. This is the closest I've got to in my, in my things that I just happen to have come across um, to, to an analogy, a modern analogy for what Chazal are talking about here. What they're talking about and what the Sfatim Met again says in number 12, let's finish with this, is going back to the original question about Lech Lecha, which the Ramban asks, and the Sfatim Met pick, picks it up again. And he says, why did God, God tell Avraham Lech, Lech Lecha before the, telling us the prior information which we need to know about Avraham, which is, why did God love him? We don't have that first level of knowledge about Avraham, that he was lovable in some way, that he was special. We don't hear that. All we hear is suddenly out of the blue, God says Lech Lecha. And that conundrum, the answer that, that he offers here is from the Zohar, that that itself is Avraham's excellence. What is it? Sheshama Zehama Amar. That he was open to hearing the words Lech Lecha. Now, when we say open, that's not quite enough. It's not just he's open, as we say casually. It's that he was thirsty, that there's something restless in him. There's something that's looking, looking perhaps in the wrong places. And that all his sins are part of the quest. I think that's what the Shem Mishmol is really saying. Well, that's what the Talmud is saying. That he's looking for Geshem. Whereas really he's not giving enough respect to his own capacity for being the place of the Shekhinah. That can be transformed so that he recognizes the Shekhinah in the most important way possible, which is Avram was the one who could hear what God said. God says it to everyone. Now that is a very, you know, it's, it's a modern, it sounds like a modern reading. God says it to everyone, but not everyone can hear. You know, it sounds like a sermon from, from today. It's 19th century. It's a Hasidic source. They themselves were revolutionary thinkers. But as I've tried to show, it's not entirely revolutionary. It goes back to deep organic sources in the Midrash, where the organic imagery of watering and, and life and bringing forth bringing forth new life uh, is there in this spiritual and personal sense. And it needs someone who is in a position to be able to hear. That someone may be setting themselves up to be the kind of person, it's a very difficult kind of person to be, and I'll, I'll finish with this. Um, Etty Hilsom was a young Jewish woman uh, in the time of the Shoah who was engaged in a lifelong struggle to transform herself. A person of great vitality, of great love of life, who as things got worse and worse around her, 
began to discover in herself resources of love and compassion and great pain and great anguish for her people and volunteered to go out to the local camp. She was a Dutch, young Dutch woman and she went to Westerbork where she exposed herself to all the sights and sounds of people who were to in total despair and in total terror. And she acted there as a bracha, heye bracha. That is somewhere as a source of some kind of way of taking into herself the suffering. In the end, she went to Auschwitz. I think also uh, she volunteered for that where she died. But short, she, she wrote a memoir. She wrote letters and a memoir. And in shortly before she died, at the end of the, em, the memoir, she has this sentence, which may not strike one when one first reads it, but it, it began to sink in, uh, where she says, perhaps what I really want is to be the thinking, feeling heart in this whole camp. I want to be the lev, you know, the lev of Avraham. I want to be the heart that doesn't shut out always the reality of what is going on around me, that agrees to feel, that agrees to open myself up, at least sometimes, and to take all that into me, to take it, to take it into me and in some way give back something that can be a source of blessing. Now, this is not a program that she had. She's obviously talking in kind of poetic language, which could well be a private language. You know, what she really meant by this, that I want to be the heart that, unlike everyone else, is, is thinking and feeling, you know, trying, trying to be there, and at the same time to be there, to be there for the... Uh, the those of whom she is the beating heart. Um, I'm not entirely sure why I feel the necessity to end with this, but but it, it seems to me somehow to answer to Avram, to Avram who is on a similar quest. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, please do ask questions or make uh, comments if you have, if you have. Any, um, I'm very open now to, to hearing. Um, and as I said, if you'd like to write, then uh, I'm also open to reading what you have to say. Um, please. Aviva, this Dutch woman was not Jewish, right? She was Jewish. She was Jewish. Oh. She was not Jewish uh, in terms of observance. Right, but I mean, she was able to visit the camps and uh, be free to visit. She, she, had wasn't a, she had a public, she wasn't visiting when she came, she, for a while she was visiting, but then she decided to go and live in the camp. Uh, in uh, it's an extraordinary story because yeah. it's so wide reaching, you know, anyone could be her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tadam. Ellen.